Hi, I'm Dr. Human, and today we're going to talk about ethical and societal issues with creative marketing messages. One of the major areas of concern for advertising regulation is the protection of vulnerable groups, such as children. Children are the vulnerable population that receives the most attention from regulators, and marketing to children is the source of the most heated debates. There are two perspectives on advertising to children. Critics of advertising to children argue that it should be banned or severely restricted, which it is in some countries. Consumer advocates argue that children are vulnerable to advertising because they lack knowledge and skills to critically evaluate advertising claims, and they cannot differentiate between programs and commercials. However, marketers argue that advertising is a part of life and children must learn to deal with it. Marketers also argue that children must learn through the socialization process and they must acquire skills needed to function in the marketplace. So why are children considered vulnerable to advertising? Children do not understand the persuasive intent of advertising. They have difficulty separating fantasy from reality. They find it difficult to control their emotions and children do not have the psychological wall that blocks most ads in adults. Now, what is the ethical principle at work in regulation that protects the vulnerable from advertising manipulation? It's fairness due to unequal power. When someone has less power than you, you have a responsibility not to take advantage of them. There are a number of marketing activities aimed at children that cause concerns. In terms of marketing to children through mobile devices, cell phones are an increasingly integral part of our lives, including our children's lives. Marketers see young children as the next big growth market. And various types of promotional efforts are being used, including ringtones, mobile games, and text-in contests. The ability for marketers to infiltrate yet another media domain with promotions and messages further blurs the line between advertising and entertainment. And this has many parents and consumer advocate groups concerned. Corporate programs that place strong sales messages in educational materials supplied to schools have also come under attack, and children's advocates are particularly concerned about marketing to children on the internet. The federal government has passed legislation to protect children's online privacy called COPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and KRU, the Children's Advertising Review Unit, also has guidelines on this topic. With school budgets consistently being tight, some marketers are providing funds in exchange for access to the captive market of school children. The Consumers Union has the following classification system for these school commercialization activities. First of all, there are in-school ads. These are ads in places such as school buses, scoreboards, bulletin boards, as well as coupons and free samples to students. Other aspects might include schools selling naming rights to companies and distributing ads in student newspapers. Then there are ads in the classroom, ads in classroom magazines or television programs. One group operating under the name Channel One has created substantial controversy in this area. It provides 12 minutes of news to participating schools, but contains two minutes of commercials for which there is evidence of influence. Then there is corporate sponsored educational materials, also called SEMs. SEMs are teaching materials provided by corporations, usually for free. They come in various forms, including posters, activity sheets, and multimedia teaching aids. And then there are corporate-sponsored contest and incentive programs. Now, this is when companies gain access through various contests and incentives, such as prizes for travel, free pizza, and so on. And finally, another great area of concern include direct sales, usually by food product companies. For example, the placement of carbonated beverage machines is also under increasing pressure in schools because of health concerns related to students' obesity and juvenile diabetes. In regard to internet marketing in children, two major concerns have emerged, invading children's privacy and the exploitation of children through manipulative techniques. Now, the internet is different from other media that children confront. First, it's harder for adults to supervise the internet. Second, the internet is interactive. It can respond to you based on how you respond to it. And this is qualitatively different from other types of media. Third, because of AI, the internet can learn. Internet programs can record and recall past interactions with consumers, which allows them to tailor their responses and fully customize messages targeted to a specific person's wants, needs, and personality. Because children cannot buy advertised products, their parents must buy them. However, children can get parents to buy for them through pester power. This includes ads that encourage children to whine and nag their parents for the advertised product. And this nagging tends to undermine the parents' rational decision-making. Ads that encourage this sort of behavior are unethical on utilitarian grounds because it leads to unhappiness in both parents and children. Now let's look at advertising and stereotyping. Although the law often has ethical principles as its basis, 
Ethics goes beyond the minimum of the law, and none of these ethical issues are illegal. But think about Kant's categorical imperative, respect the dignity of each individual person. How does ethnic or gender stereotyping fit with that basic ethical principle? Well, there are plenty of people in business or society in general who will do whatever they can get away with without any regard for the dignity of others. In fact, according to Harvard psychologist Dr. Martha Stout, author of The Sociopath Next Door, roughly one in 25 Americans is a sociopath. And what do sociopaths do? Sociopaths use deceit and manipulation on a regular basis. They are irresponsible in their obligations to other people, and they live by the pleasure principle. If it feels good to them and they're able to avoid consequences, they will do it. Now, as I've said, advertising is often criticized for portraying various gender and ethnic groups in ways that are unflattering. And many critics of advertising Advertising have also argued that it does not stay contemporary and reflect current changed roles of women. Despite recognition that advertisers should be sensitive to portrayals of people, ad agencies are finding it increasingly difficult not to offend some segment of the population. Here are some of the various forms of stereotyping that advertising is often accused of creating and perpetuating. These include gender stereotyping, portrayal of women as sex objects, ethnic stereotyping or inaccurate representation of minorities, and then unflattering portrayals of the elderly. Now here's an actual ad for Airwalk shoes. How might this be viewed by consumers? Is this woman being portrayed as a sex object? Does this ad contain cues that are sexually suggestive? Does this ad present an image of sexual submission? Well, this ad was criticized by some women's groups who argue that it shows a sexually submissive and available woman. The critics argue that the ad contains a number of symbolic cues that are sexually suggestive and combine to reinforce an image of the woman's sexual submission to a man. These clues include the heart-shaped box indicating love, the color red, which symbolizes passion, and the heavy lipstick, which is sexually suggestive, as is her slinky red dress. Now, is it always unethical to use a sex appeal in advertising? Why or why not? What do you think? Idolizing beauty in advertising to make women dissatisfied with their own bodies so they'll buy a beauty product also has ethical and societal ramifications. First, it's been shown to cause anorexia in some women. Second, it distracts women from other important areas of life. Third, the beauty myth locks women into gender stereotypes. And fourth, some say that this is really just a male power move to oppress women. Now, what are the ethics of idolizing beauty? Well, Baird has said that ethics are shared expectations for behavior in particular circumstances. Do we expect advertisements to show beautiful people? Do we expect fashion clothing ads to show beautiful people? Do we expect fragrance ads to use sexual appeals? Now, Immanuel Kant took that extreme position of moral absolutism in his categorical imperative, where certain actions are always wrong, regardless of the consequences or the situation. But there are obviously some gradients A white lie told to save someone's feeling is not the same as telling a lie through a deliberate falsehood to enrich yourself or your company. So how do we know where to draw the line? Of course, there are many ethical and societal issues with marketing communication over social media, uh, one of which is how you handle complaints on social media and its effect on your reputation. 